Hey there once again YouTube. It has been a little while. I've been doing some work on my website, but I am still around. Don't you worry. Uh, if you want to go to my website, please go to the description box below. Click monitorsize.wubi.com right under my email address. I am updating a lot of stuff on there because there are a few mistakes throughout the website and outdated information that I just wanted to update. I am doing that. My website can teach you how to download, access, and even analyze seismic and GPS deformation data to keep a good eye on volcanic and tectonic hazard areas. Very interesting stuff has been happening lately, guys. So, in uh, Hawaii, there was a magnitude 4.1 earthquake. It wasn't too major, but also Nevada saw an earthquake in Steamboat Geyser, again, actually, erupted two days ago. Surprisingly, I thought it was dying off, guys. It almost was late for, what, two and a half weeks or something like that? We'll go take a look at that in just a second. Here we have the Stromboli volcano from Skyline Webcams. Stromboli is in Italy, very active volcano, very awesome, I love it. So, let's go take a look first at my website, and then we'll take a look at the steamboat eruptions, then the magnitude 4.1 in Hawaii, and then the magnitude 4.0 in Nevada, in a very interesting location too. Here we are at my website, but under the more drop-down menu, under Quake Statistics. Now, I am doing a big overhaul of this section of my website, because I didn't do the 2018 statistics, I was late on that. Um, but let's not talk about that right now, but I'm doing a big overhaul guys Let's see you have Yellowstone Caldera, Long Valley Caldera, Newberry Caldera, Mount Rainier, and the Cascadia Subduction Zone I have revamped all of these except for Long Valley and Cascadia Subduction Zone I'm doing those two tonight So you'll see that those have outdated information However, if you go to like Yellowstone, Newberry, or Mount Rainier I do have updated information that shows the reported counts, the reported statistics for Yellowstone Spreadsheet format, largest magnitudes per year, then I show the plots of the largest earthquake to occur between 1998 and 2019. And we also see the period of uplift and subsidence via LKWY at the northern tip of Yellowstone Lake. This chart was created by myself. And then I created some other charts detailing data from the spreadsheet showing how reported earthquake statistics have increased throughout the few years. Increased or decreased, it's your choice to believe which is which. Now, I want to go to the Seismic Events drop-down menu, go to Steamboat Geyser 2019. So here's the 13th eruption of 2019, which happened about two days ago. It occurred at 425 UTC on April 26, 2019, which is also 1025 PM Mountain Time, April 25th, 2019. This eruption is by far the largest steamboat eruption of 2019, according to the amplitudes and the length of the seismic trace. You can tell frequencies have also risen on the spectral plot. We were seeing the weaker eruptions being around, what, 15 to 25 hertz? I, I forget which, but it's shown on this page anyways. Uh, about 15 to 25 hertz or so, but we notice the strength is increasing along with the frequencies. So that is very interesting to note. I don't know why. Very interesting how the stronger the steamboat eruption is, the higher the frequencies are. I think that's very odd. That could have to do with the it being surface waves, but you could tell it is starting to look like uh, Steamboat Geyser is returning to early 2018 levels, when it was actually mid-2018 levels. When it was erupting, I mean, it would go up to like 1E5, which is 100,000 amplitude count. It they Oh, yeah, pretty strong, guys. They had some pretty strong eruptions back in 2018. Now, let me pan this up just real quick. This is Steamboat Geyser in the steam phase of eruption on March 16, 2018, just a day after the first water hydrothermal eruption in 2018. Photo was taken by Benez Hosini. Well, guys, it does seem Steamboat Geyser is telling us that it is alive and well. The most recent Steamboat eruption was the 13th eruption of 2019, which is also the 45th eruption since it reactivated in early 2018, and is approximately one and a half weeks late. Yeah. So that means it's been like two and a half weeks since the last eruption, right? I think it was April 8th, right? And now it's April 26th. My goodness, that's a big gap. That's why I thought it died, guys. I thought for about a week there it died, but nope, it's still alive and well. Also, this most recent eruption is the largest of 2019, and it is possible the amplitudes of the steamboat eruptions might be returning to how they were in mid to late summer of 2018. The frequencies are increasing as well, as I said. Are the eruptions getting bigger? It will be interesting to see where this leads. Again, this eruption was more than one week late, meaning it's been over two weeks since the last eruption. 
seeing it has been about 17 days or so since the last one. It seems Steamboat is now erupting on a non-regular basis. It was holding a near-weekly schedule for the longest time, and then about a few eruptions ago, it just broke its, uh, broke its pattern for some weird reason. Now, it should erupt again, however, in the next two weeks at the maximum. I expect no later than May 10th, 2019, but I don't know if it's going to return to its near-weekly schedule. It could erupt in a week, two weeks, but I don't think it can last two, two and a half weeks without erupting. I think pretty much 17 days is the longest it can go without erupting if it's still an active geyser, but we'll have to wait and see where that leads. Again here, the seismogram spectrogram spectra plots to the most recent and largest steamboat geyser eruption at Yellowstone National Park Norris Geyser Basin in 2019. There it is right there. Going up to about 45,000 amplitude count at the highest. Let's go down. Here it is on YNM on the heli quarter, and let's move on. All right, so we're going to look at a few things. Just a quick overview. There was a magnitude 5.1, supposedly at 10 kilometers in depth. Multiple people felt it in Honduras. Very interesting location. Then we also had a 5.0 in Venezuela. Yep. At 49.2 kilometers in depth, people reported feeling that as well. We did have an earthquake in Hawaii I'll look at in just a second. But something just popped up just in the past minute or so. Let's scroll up. Man, my computer's lagging. Come on, buddy. Come on, there we go. Okay, so we had a magnitude 2.2 at 7 kilometers in depth. South Wenatchee, Washington, in eastern Washington, right up there. Uh, we'll take a look at that in just a second. I do want to take a look at Hawaii first. Okay, notice we've got 1.8, 2.2, 1.8, 2.0, 1.8, 2.3, 1.7, 1.6, 1.8, 1.9, 1.10, 1.11, 1.12, 1.13, 1.14, 1.15, 1.16, 1.17, 1.18, 1
Because harmonic volcanic tremor is basically native to the state of Hawaii, guys. I mean, they probably see it all the time. Especially during the Kilauea eruptions, guys. They were seen all the time from the free flow of magma. Volcanic tremor is more thought to be along the lines of multiple low-frequency events occurring over and over and over. But I'm not going to get into that now for the sake of time. We did see another possible earthquake right here. I don't know. That looks kind of strange to me. And then we had another earthquake right here. This, in my opinion, does not look like an earthquake at all. This actually looks more like a rock fall or a collapse. In my opinion, I, I'm probably going to be wrong about that, but I'm just saying. Just putting that out there. As of the most recent data stream, as of 12.52 p.m. Pacific Time, April 28, 2018, we do see more of these strange-looking, weird, odd events. I just, I don't even know what they could be, guys. I'm sorry. And going forward, we see many of them. Many, many, many of them. And the most recent data stream, we see these weird surface events, which I still have yet to find out what these are. Obviously, they're not really real seismic events, because... Seismic events really don't look like that in that way, that specific. But I still have yet to discover what these are. So again, let's go back up. Here we go. This is the magnitude 4.2 at 3.6 kilometers in depth just to the southwest of Puoo Volcano. And press OK. Oh, there we go. Dominant frequencies below 5 hertz, but we do see a hump between 5 and 10 hertz. Weaker frequencies obviously going well beyond that. It is not a low frequency earthquake. But interesting nonetheless. And there's a look at the waveforms. Now let's take a look at the GPS data just real quick from JCUS, which is the same station here. So it's basically right near the epicenter. And the uh, the trends you are about to see are basically consistent all across the south southeastern section of the Big Island of Hawaii where Kilauea is. Because it's refilling, guys. And as you're about to see in just a second, the uplift that is occurring in the Kilauea Puoo that that whole area the uplift that's occurring is much greater than it was before the 2018 eruptions guys no joke here take a look at this now remember guys i do teach you how to get your own gps data and make your own GP, uh, gps charts on my website under the how to drop down menu go to the gps page but beware there are some mistakes in that video that i i have to redo that video i am redoing that very soon because there are also more possibilities that i did not include in there that i just recently found out about see guys we're all still learning about this stuff, huh? So, we're going to go to Delta U, which will show any growing or shrinking trends. Remember, STD Dev is detrended data, meaning it won't show any trends of uplift or subsidence over a long period of time. But let's go to Delta U from 2017, January 1st. January 1st, 2017, which is before the eruptions of 2018. Select this entire column. The entire column. It'll take just a second, guys. Now, this is how I make my own GPS charts. And as you're going to see in my monthly volcano update in the next uh, week or so, a little bit less than a week probably, I have figured out how to make a scatter chart. I didn't know. I did not know that Excel gives you that possibility, which is, check this out. You'll notice. Notice that it looks very similar to the ones that the professionals use on volcanos.usgs.gov. I do not use the online deformation charts anymore at all. Now, check this out. So this is from 2017, January 1st. And notice we do have JCUS and supplied by U and RIGS08 reference frame. This is showing uplift or subsidence. Subsidence is downwards, uplift is upwards. Notice how there is a very small, barely noticeable trend at all of subsidence right prior to this, right? And then, boom, right here, as you can see, uh, if you go on volcanoes.usgs.gov, you can see this on all the GPS charts around the area. This big dip right here from the magma just leaving Kilauea and going to the Lower East Rift Zone for no reason. It just said, hey, guys, let's get up and go. And it went. And, you know, scientists say, oh, a volcano can't sprout there. A volcano can't sprout here. Yeah, well, I call BS on that just a little bit. You need to be open to volcanic eruptions occurring in places that have never seen volcanic eruptions before. I mean, it's possible. There's magma everywhere down there, and now we know that magma is independent and goes wherever it wants to, guys. Seriously, magma is very independent. But again, we see the 2018 eruptions caused a large, large drop in subsidence. But look at the level of uplift that is occurring ever since the eruptions calmed. Look at that. Do you notice that? Look at the angle. The angle is much, much greater 
than the angle just prior to the 2018 eruptions. Yes, guys, there was barely any uplift at all during the uh, right before the 2018 eruptions. So, isn't that interesting? So, uplift is greater than it was prior to the eruptions. Now, I just want to go to January 1st, 2019. Where are you? January 1st, 2019. Let's just go right here. Let's just go right here and go, oh, nope, I don't want both. Oh, oh, oh. Is it going to do it? There we go. All right, let's press insert, press scatter chart, and here it is. This is the uplift since September 2018, right here. Notice the constant, guys, almost constant, perfect uplift. Again, sorry for repeating myself, but it is very interesting that uplift is much greater in the Kilauea Puoo area right now than it was prior to the 2018 eruptions. I, I, I was not expecting to see that. I really was not. And I just found that out this morning when I was looking at the GPS data. So I still am a little shocked. I don't know. I think another eruption is approaching. I don't know when. There's really no sign of when that could be. But I do believe an eruption definitely is approaching. I don't know when again. But let's move on to something else, shall we? So we just took a look at the 4.2 and the nearest GPS deformation data for Hawaii. But now let's take a look at the Nevada earthquake. Notice we do have some earthquakes reported for Nevada in this area right here. Let's go to terrain just so you can see some of the, let's see, Fallon, Nevada. Let's zoom in to get a better look, shall we? Uh, come on. My goodness, my computer is slow. It's right next to State Route 50, right on this northern hub, right near Austin, Nevada, right up here near the New Pass Range. We did see a 2.2, 2.2, a 3.5 at 4.8 kilometers in depth, a 4.0 at 4.0 kilometers in depth, and a 2.4 and a 2.9. Let's go back to satellite. I just want to show you there are many faults in this area, guys. Many, many faults, and it is my opinion this is not volcanic in nature. And you know, guys, a lot of stuff that I believe is volcanic sometimes is, sometimes not. This one, however, I am contradicting what I usually talk about because usually I focus on volcanic activity, right? This, in my opinion, is tectonic in origin. That is my humble opinion. I could be very wrong about that, but as you're about to see, it is along some of these faults in between this fault right down here, the Eastern Edwards Creek Valley Fault Zone, and then up here near the unnamed faults of the Augusta Mountains. They're not named yet, I guess. But as you see down here, there are many, many mountains. I do not see any volcanoes. I could be wrong. There's got to be volcanoes and cinder cones out here because the crust is very thin in like Nevada, Utah, a lot of those deserty areas. The crust is very, very thin and allows for magma to push up sometimes. But these mainly look like mountain ranges. I'm not seeing any actual cinder cones or lava flows or volcanoes, but I could be wrong. Looks like there's a little bit of a lava flow up here, kind of, but I don't know where it's coming from. That could just be a stream, maybe? I don't know. That's not the focus of this video, though. I just want to take a look at the data real quick. So again, magnitude 4.0. Uh-oh. There we go. And just recently, they reported magnitude 2.3. Let's go to the event page of the 4.0 just real fast. Again, no surprise at all. All. The magnitude 4.0 was not felt by anyone. That is not a surprise to me whatsoever because there's literally, guys, literally nobody in this area. I mean, it it should be named, not Nevada, but no man's land. I mean, people obviously live in Nevada, but so that'd be a bad name for it. <laughs> but for this centered area where this earthquake occurred, let's name it no man's land because it really is no man's land. Let's go to origin, shall we? Go to phases. Come on, click on arrival time. The closest seismic station to this event, 13.2 seconds of an arrival time showing that the station is not that close, but we still will get a good idea of what the earthquake looked like and how it propagated away from the source. The NN network, uh, station CMK6, broadband vertical, no location code. Let's take a look at that now in the program swarm. And there's actually, let me tell you this now, right here, notice. Notice we have Austin, Nevada, State Route 50, right above the hump. Notice, let me go back to the 4.0, just real quick. All right, so notice we have State Route 50. Here's the hump right here, and here's Austin, Nevada. So notice these mountain ranges right here, kind of like an upside-down U shape. Let's go to real-time maps. Notice the U shape right here, the hump right at SR50, 
Austin, Nevada. That means, let's go back, notice right up here, and let's go back. Notice that the earthquake swarm took place right in this area. See? And look what we have here. We have a GPS station right at the epicenter of these earthquakes. So if this is volcanic in nature, we definitely will see sustained uplift of at least a few millimeters per year or maybe per month. Shouldn't be too crazy. I haven't looked at it yet, but we'll go take a look at that in just a second. It's GPS station news, but first let's take a look at the seismic data and then we'll get to the GPS data. Here we are in the seismic program swarm with the closest seismic station to the magnitude 4.0. The CMK6 station in the NN network, broadband vertical, no location code given. Persistent rescale is off. Overlap is set to 95. Here, let me change this real quick. There we go. Now, I do have enabled a high pass 0.8 hertz filter to the eighth power. I'm going to press OK. Now, what time did this earthquake... Now, look at this webby quarter, guys. Look at this heli quarter. Excuse me. Yeah, it looks all messed up. Uh -huh, yeah. Can't really see much, can you? Except for like an earthquake here and there. But as we look at the data streams, we do get a good look. Although the background activity is very minimal. There, this station does not pick up background activity basically at all. Very quiet station. Notice we do get a good look at some of the earthquakes. However, I want to go back just real quick. Let's go to, let's see, which ones occurred? 2.9 occurred at 519 UTC. 2.4 at 1020 then around 1700 is right when we had the 4.0, 3.5, 2.2, and 2.3. So after 1700, this one right here was the original, let's see, 2.9. So they reported this as a magnitude 2.9 right near the epicenter. In my opinion, this looks like a normal tectonic event. That's my opinion, guys. Let's move forward. Another microquake right there. Little teeny tiny. Look at the background activity, guys. Nothing. I mean, this station is silent. I mean, whoever placed the station placed it in a really good spot. Really good spot. I mean, man, I've never seen a station this silent from background noise before. It's like a seismologist's dream to have it to have it this silent, really, though. Okay, not seeing... Oh, 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 what was that? Hello. Oh, that's definitely a teleseism. That's for sure. Okay. Keep going forward. There's another little micro quake right there, which was I think was the 2.2 that they reported, I believe. Keep going forward. Keep going forward. Let's go all the way forward to 1700 UTC. We're down 1238. Come on. Come on. 1542. I want to go just right before. 1612. Okay, that's good enough. Go forward. Go forward. Not seeing much. Oh, man. Very silent. Wow. And 17.04, let's see, 17.03.16, it took about 13 seconds to arrive at the station. This is the magnitude 4.0 at 4.0 kilometers in depth in Nevada. And here's a look at the waveforms right here. In my opinion, this looks like a normal high-frequency tectonic event. No low-frequency background tremor whatsoever at all. A little few microquakes. Here's an aftershock right here, which they reported to be a 3.5. Yes, 3.5 at 4.8 kilometers in depth. That's this one right here. Again, normal high range frequencies, which is what we should see. Not seeing any background tremor. Notice that? There might be a little something here and there, but no background tremor, just some high frequency aftershocks. That's it. And that's it. And right here, you probably would think that, oh no, did I really just do that? Come on, let's go forward, guys. Come on. Oh, and here we go. Okay. So you might think that this is an earthquake swarm, right? Now, this is really why... So a lot of things that look uh, appear on heli quarters look like earthquakes or look like earthquake swarms. But when you actually look at the data, it's not an earthquake at all sometimes, guys. That's why you cannot just look at the heli quarter and be like, we got a quake here. We got a quake there. Look, we got another quake here. We got another quake there. Of course, that is available to do for simple overview when you know for a fact that there's like an earthquake swarm. But I always tell everyone, just download the data and plug it into the program swarm. It's so quick, so simple, so easy, and gives you way more accuracy than just pointing at something and saying what you think. Really though, I, I seriously, let's look at one of these and I'll show you an example. These are not earthquakes. These are electronic spikes. These are electronic malfunctions. Let's look at this. Notice how on the spectrogram they did look, and sometimes on the web recorders, these can look like earthquakes to the untrained eye. 
But if you actually open it in the seismic program swarm or another seismic program, you'll notice they are not earthquakes. I thought they were at first too, but these are not. Very strange characteristics though. There's another aftershock. Don't know what that was. And that's it. Uh, the most recent data stream of 109 p.m. Pacific time, April 28th, 2019. Now let's take a look at the GPS deformation data. Remember how I said, oh, where to go? Okay. So the earthquake swarm occurred right in this area, right here, right where this GPS station is located, news. So let's go take a look at that in Microsoft Excel. Here we have GPS deformation data for the station news, which is right at the epicenter of where these earthquakes occurred in Nevada today. Since January 1st, 2010, one sample is taken per day, Delta U. Take this column, go all the way down for all the dates. This will show, oh, oh, no. All right, this will show either uplift or subsidence or any growing or shrinking trends. Remember, STD Dev does not show any trends. It is detrended data. Now keep going, keep going. This will take just a second, guys, because there's a lot of data here. This is how I create my own custom GPS charts. Now for a smaller time frame of about maybe a month, two months, three months, maybe six months, I'd like to do a line chart for GPS deformation data. But when it's a long period of time, like longer than a year or so, I use a scatter chart, which is what the uh, volcanoes.usgs.gov uses to show their GPS deformation data. And keep going. And we are at the... Come on, buddy. There we go. Okay. Since January 1st, 2010 to today, uh, excuse me, to today, April 28th, 2018. I do not want a line chart. No, I don't. What am I doing? Scatter chart. There we go. Okay, this will show uplift or subsidence. Remember, the, the uh, motion of the North American plate has been removed. This is NA12 from UNR, University of Nevada, uh, Reno. I believe that's what UNR stands for. Now notice, let me add a trend line, which you probably won't be able to see very well, but let me just add it anyways. You can barely see the trend line is showing tiny tiny uplift i mean it's it's almost constant it is virtually almost constant since 2010 but notice there's a slight dip right here it seems and it goes right back up but we do see almost constant uplift in this area since january 1st 2010 but but and i mean a big but look at the meters on the side these are in meters and it doesn't matter if they're negative or not it's not actually showing the actual level of the ground all we want to do is know the difference between values. So notice 0 0.15 meters. Move the decimal point over to the right three times. One, two, three. That's 150 millimeters. Two, one, two, three to 145 millimeters. That means from one line to one line, each horizontal section, you notice that from line to line is only five millimeters. So it is only risen, I'm going to say, 10 millimeters. There has only been 10 millimeters of uplift in the past eight, nine years. That's nothing. Actually, nine years, yeah. That's nothing, guys. But still, it's still occurring. It's still slightly, very slowly rising. But I, ha I doubt that has to do with volcanic activity. If it was volcanic, it would be much quicker, much bigger, at least in my opinion. But we'll still keep an eye on this area, nonetheless. Now, here we are as of 1.14 p.m. Pacific Time, April 28, 2019. I just wanted to see if anything else occurred since I stopped recording. I don't see much. There's another 2.3 in Nevada. Again, Nevada has seen a slight increase in seismicity as of late. But again, we did see a magnitude 2.2 in South Wenatchee, excuse me, in Washington State, in eastern Washington. At 7 kilometers in depth, let's take a look at that location right now. And we'll just very, very quickly see what it looks like from the closest seismic station i just want to see what type of earthquake it was man bear with me guys my computer is very slow very very slow guys also go to my website go to the seismo blog i some people might not have seen my most recent blog there but i did show some seismic audio and some other cool information about non-volcanic tectonic tremor it's very cool i've never really studied that until recently Okay, so we see just south of Wenatchee, right here, guys, right in no man's land, another piece of, man, no man's land areas around the United States have been getting rocked by earthquakes lately, guys. So here we are at the USGS event page. Stat Notice the review status, automatic. 
this magnitude 2.2 at 7 kilometers in depth will most likely change. Every time that you see automatic right here, it is almost a 100% possibility the magnitude or the depth or even the location will change. That is because computers are not trustworthy 100% of the time. A seismologist is always required to get it down, right? I mean, why would you trust a computer algorithm more than a human being who's actually studied it for a long time, right? I mean, of course, computers get it close. They can get it very, very close much of the time. But I see, whenever I see review status automatic, some people don't even look at this. And they say, oh, USGS removed an earthquake or, you know, maybe sometimes they do do that. But I'm just saying, oh, USGS made the magnitude smaller or made the depth look shallower. Well, what if that was for a good reason? You wouldn't want inaccurate information out there, would you? But then again, I can agree with both sides. I can agree with both sides on this. USGS does downgrade quakes a little bit too much for certain areas, but I have seen many earthquakes upgraded. Yes, I have. But then again, what if there was a false earthquake? Like, for example, in uh, near Stevens Pass in Washington State, they reported, I believe, I forget the exact number, so uh, forgive me if I'm wrong. I believe it's a magnitude 3.5 or 4.0 or something like that near Stevens Pass in Washington State here, where I live. Um, come to find out, the algorithm that records earthquakes and reports them, guess what happened? It was a global distant earthquake. It was, there was like a magnitude 8.0 somewhere in the world or something like that. Very strong earthquake, but the computer thought that it was coming from a localized area. And actually, if you looked at the data, there was no local earthquake during that time period. So, just think of this. If the earthquake really is not real, why would you leave it on there? And it does happen. Algorithms do make mistakes. And also, sometimes magnitudes should be downgraded a little bit. Oh, I'm going to get I'm going to get whooped for saying that right now, guys. I'm going to get such a big backlash for saying that. But but magnitudes should be upgraded as well. All of this has to do with accuracy. We should try to be as accurate as possible either way. Like why would you fudge the data to make things look more concerning? Why would you fudge the data to make things look less concerning? All we need to do is worry about the truth. But again, status is automatic, meaning a seismologist has not looked at the data, so this magnitude and depth and possibly location will change as well. But it still has these stations that it recorded it from. The closest station, 6.2 seconds arrival time, so that's pretty close to the station. ETW in the UW network, short period vertical, no location code. Let's take a look at that right now. All right, I had persistent rescale turned off, overlap set to 95. I do not need a filter. Here we are, station ETW in the UW network, short period, vertical, no location code. And this was the closest station to the earthquake, as was stated per the computer algorithm, which actually, that's one thing that the computer usually gets correct, is what the closest station is. Because that, that one's the easiest, to see where the P wave draws away from. Because whatever station in a network sees the P wave arrive first is the station that was closest to the earthquake epicenter. Here it is right here, the magnitude 2.2. Let's look at the P wave real quick. Upwards going P wave, normal. Let's zoom in, go to the spectrogram. Looks like a normal magnitude 2.2 earthquake. Not seeing much in the background except some very weak, low frequency background noise. I do not believe that is tremor or anything volcanic. I don't even know if it's possible for volcano. Ah, wait, I just contradicted myself. Earlier in this video, I said it's possible no matter where it is. And I still hold to that belief, so... Who knows, guys? Maybe a volcano could sprout in Seattle, Washington. <laughs> Man, where be? Where, where's Tommy Lee Jones, guys? Where is he? We need him. I actually just watched the uh, volcano movie the other day. Actually, that, that's one of my favorite movies now. It's In some ways, it's kind of funny. And they actually call harmonic tremor, harmonic tremors. And really, only seismologists will get that. I mean, it's because you don't call it harmonic tremors. You call it harmonic tremor. No S at the end, unless you're talking about multiple harmonic tremor episodes. But usually you'd say episodes. Okay, I'm getting off track. I'm getting off track, I know. I am confused. What is this? Right here. Do you notice that? Right there. At 1940 UTC, let's see if there are any global earthquakes that can account for that low frequency event. 1940 UTC, let's see a 2.1, 2.1. No, this is when the earthquake happened and the low frequency event happened right after. No, I'm not seeing it. There's no global earthquake that could account for this low frequency event. 
I'm going to check to see if it's surface noise. Why don't you come with me? Let's check it out. Because as you notice, this looks like a low frequency event right here, doesn't it? Starts right here. Let's go forward. That looks like a low frequency event, in my opinion. That does. Look, look at the frequencies. You notice that on the spectrogram? Well below 5 hertz. Let's see. This is the most recent. Well, those are electronic issues right there. If there's the magnitude 2.2, then just about a minute or two later, we see that low frequency event. So let's go back. Here's the 2.2. Quick arrival time. Let's do the second closest station and compare and see if it does show. WAT2 in the UW network, broadband vertical. Uh, just come with me real quick. WAT2 dash dash HHZ. And we scroll down and we click the download link. And it has downloaded. Let's wait for it to download just real fast. All right, here we are in Swarm. The file has downloaded. Let's open file. And let's see. Let's get the most recent data stream that I have downloaded. Come on, guys. There we go. Okay. WAT2. Uh-oh. I think I already see it. That's very, very, very interesting. Okay. Persist to rescale off, overlap set to 95, since there are going to be some very, very low frequency background microseisms. Just going to do 0 0.8 hertz. Don't worry, it will not get rid of the low frequency event. Low frequency events usually occur 0 0.5 hertz to 5 hertz or something like that. But they usually don't go much below 0 0.8 hertz or so. So here again, here's the magnitude 2.2 that occurred in Wenatchee. Then going forward, notice what we have right here. Notice this right here. What is that? That's real. It's showing on two stations. And these stations are multiple miles apart, guys. So this is not surface noise. So let's compare just real fast, shall we? Let's zoom out. Pull this over here. Let's go to the spectrogram. Notice we do see a low frequency event right there. Let's go to the spectrogram. Notice we do see a low frequency event right here. It seems to start right in 1940. Notice, 1940. Here, let me zoom out one more time just so you can get a broad look. Notice that right there. Now, let's zoom out on this one from 1940 and starts to diminish around 1942. From 1940 and starts to diminish around 1942. That is a very brief, very simple cross-correlation. Do not cross-correlate like that. You should use multiple stations and their P-wave arrivals. But right now, we know these stations are many miles apart. This is not a coincidence. That is a real low frequency seismic event. Maybe a quarry blast. We'll see if they report a quarry blast in this area for this time period. But I do not think it's a coincidence that this occurred. Here's the 2.2, right? This occurred just a couple minutes after the 2.2. So that's very, very... Oh, 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 oh. I'm sorry, guys. I'm sorry I messed up. I want to check out the dominant frequencies just real quick. Dominant frequencies, of course, rest below 5 hertz because it is a low frequency event. And for the closest seismic station, we see log power log frequency off below 5 hertz. Yes, it is. So it's a low frequency event, but I don't know if it, it could be a quarry blast. I don't know yet. I don't know for sure. I just thought that was very interesting. Looks like we have a second one over here. No, no, we don't. No, we don't. But again, magnitude 2.2 in Wenatchee, which is this right here. And then just about three, four minutes later, we did see a low frequency event, which could be an actual low frequency earthquake or a uh, quarry blast. I just want to see, let's see, starts at 940 right here. Right about 1940.04. Let's go over here, 1940.04. This one occurs... 1940.01. So, WA2, so it is coming from a different location. Because the P wave arrived first for the 2.2 at ETW. But the P wave arrived first for the low frequency event at WAT2. So, the epicenters do look like they are different, but this is a low frequency event. Again, don't know if it was a quarry blast or not. We'll have to wait and see what is reported because there's really not much else we can do besides just guess and just look at the data. But, yep, that's it. So, I hope you guys had a great day. Again, don't forget to check out my website. I am updating a lot of stuff on my website, especially the Quake Statistics page. I have two left to do. Cascadia Subduction Zone and Long Valley have not been done yet. I am doing those right now, but I've already done Yellowstone, Newberry, and Mount Rainier. Hope you enjoyed that. I spent a lot of time getting that done. Hopefully, it was okay. 
So hopefully it worked out. But I hope you guys have a great day. Let me know what you think. And I will be back very, 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 very soon.